Uh, IR, do, you, do we see a carbonyl? No. No, do we see an OH? No. No. OH, NH. I see, I see, I see uh, CH. Looks like an aromatic signature. Uh, it's pretty much not much there. Um, Okay, we're given formula? No, there's no formula here anywhere on this page. Let's look at the proton NMR. Uh, I see signals down here at the uh, sort of the seven region. What are these? Aromatic. Aromatic. Which favorite aromatic ring? Benzene. How many H's are on the benzene ring? Four. Four. So how many substituents are on the ring? Disubstituted benzene ring. Okay, when we have disubstituted, We have potential for isomers. It can be two substituents here. We'll learn that this is called para when we do um, when we get to test two. It could be meta or it could be ortho. Basically, these are three different isomeric structures for disubstituted. Um, what we have here is very classical, okay? This is a pair of doublets, 2H. Got two doublets each for 2H. That's very classical for a <coughs> pair of substitutes. Because look at this. How many H signals do you expect for this? Now, let's assume that the substituents are different. Because if they were the same, you'd get a different answer for this. Assume all these substituents are different. How many different signals do you get from the green? Two. Two. Because you have HA and you have HB. HAs are the same, HBs are the same. Two signals. Okay. Splitting, what would HA be? It'd be a doublet split by HB. So this would be a doublet. But how many HAs are there? See, there's two of them there. See, that's also a doublet. That's the same doublet. So it just integrates for two. Doublet 2H. Two what is this going to be? Splitting. Doublet split by the H. How many Hs are there? Two. Doublet 2H. Two you get two doublets, two Hs. That's what we have here. Very classical. These others, how many signals would you get for this? I mean, these are different. Four. 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 None of these are the same if all those are different. Four signals, it's actually also uh, four signals if, if the substituents are different. It's the only one that gives two signals. Now, if the substituents are the same, this is only one signal. Okay. But, very classical for pair substitute. These are actually difficult to tell apart. Okay? This one is very classical. Now, you gotta be careful. This typically always means this, but you don't always get that for this. Sometimes a pair of substituted will not give that. Okay? But anytime you see this, it always means this. So it goes the other way. Okay? We'll see more examples. So, right there, it looks like we've got a pair of substitute ring. Uh, it's got two substituents. What are the substituents? Oh, we've got to figure this out. Uh, I see peaks here. This is the SP3 CH region, yeah? Uh, what is this? That's your integration here, okay? I didn't, I'll give you the integration. I didn't have to, didn't have to measure it. That's two, that's two. If that, so what is that? Well, it's like one and a half times two, which is three. See, I've already given it to you. Okay. So what is this, CH3? Yes. Uh, have, what kind of neighbors does it have? No. What's well, a singlet? That means it has no neighbors, because if we had any H neighbors, it wouldn't be a doublet or a triplet or something. So what's next door to this? Is it a CH? I'm going to call this isolated Isolated CH3. As it, that is, it's isolated from neighboring CHs. What is this? CH3. 
That's another isolated CH3. Now, yes, it could be three identical CHs, but let's think horses. Like I have two, two isolated methyl groups. Now, I see a distinct difference in uh, PPM position. What do, we, what do we know about this signal, this CH3? More, more, it's more downfield. What would make it more downfield? Okay, maybe it's bonded to a chlorine. Could it be binding to a chlorine? No. No, because nothing else can bind to the chlorine. Right. If it's binding to a chlorine, you can't bind anything else there. So it's not enough for chloride. It's got to be something else. So what do you want to say it's binding to me? We don't have formula. Nitrogen. Oxygen or nitrogen. Now those are the most common heteroatoms. I mean, we could say maybe it's a tellurium or something, but let's stick with horses. <laughs> Unless you, right, because nitrogen's trivalent, or oxygen's just divalent, okay? Something here, and in your tables it calls it like a Z group or something. Um, okay? So it's either N-methyl or O-methyl. Oh. Well, let's see. Is this, bonded to a, is this methyl bonded to an O or an N? No. No, because no, it would be, it would make it move downfield. What's it bonded to most likely? If it was bonded to the benzene ring, would it put it about two to three? Yeah. Yes, it would. If you look at your tables, bonded to a ring, this is called benzylic, it's about two to three ppm. Would this be a singlet? Yes. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. There's no H there. It's a singlet 3H. Now, what's over here? Ether. Ether. How about an OCH3? Would that fit the NMR? Yes. Yes. Would this be a singlet? Yes. yes. Would it be more downfield than the other one? Yes. Yes, it's bonded to oxygen. I have a complete structure there. Does that fit IR? Yes. yes. I don't see an OH in our structure. I don't see a carbonyl. Yes. Uh, you look at your fingerprint? There, you can look down there for that CO. Is it a strong P? Okay. Um, okay, somebody mentioned nitrogen. What if we break call this nitrogen and put CH3? That would make the methyl downfield. What do you want to put here, though? It's got to have something else. Ah, I see what I see what you're doing now. Uh, can we put H there? No. No. Well, the H would be in the H and MR, and I don't see another signal. Yeah. We'd also have a peak in the IR for the NH. Mm -hmm. It's not there. Can we put another methyl there? No. no. That'd be a singlet, but it would integrate for how many? Six. It'd be a singlet six H. Yeah, you could put a chlorine there and be a very odd in chlorine bind. Would that fit? Yes. Yeah. It's weird. It actually is weird, but it would fit. Because this methyl would be downfield. Yeah. Um, how can we see a nitrogen or oxygen in what we're given? Uh, other than the peak in the IR, which is fingerprint will suspect. There you go. Uh, we would like to have some uh, additional spectroscopy. Now spec would really help. Uh, anybody know uh, any chemical tests to tell these two apart? Flame test, yeah, flame test. That's a that's kind of a caveman test. You know, that's a thousand year old test. Um, okay. Actually the spectra is the compound on the right. Okay. Now, yes, you could come up with something else. No formula is given. Obviously, this formula was given, it would have an O in it. That's got to be it. Is there something else we could do here with this formula? An isomer of this. Yeah. Okay. 
So, mass spec would help them. Well, that's why on the comprehensive spec problems, I give you mass specs. Because it actually will help. Um, okay. Uh, I think there's one more to do. I want, uh, if you haven't done it, you need to be doing these. Uh, we'll come back to that, and we'll also pick up with the NMR on Monday, sort of right where we're there, and we'll, we'll do carbon NMR, and we'll start finishing up NMR on Monday and probably into Wednesday. Uh, today, though, the rest of the day, we need to look at alkene oxidation. Any questions about alcohol oxidation? <laughs> So we see on the front, the body uh, oxidizes estradiol to the ketone. It doesn't use KMO4 or anything. It uses uh, nice enzymes. Any questions about Alcohol oxidation. The purple is kind of warm. Uh, it's kind of an outline. I'm not referring to too much. You can use it sort of just to go back and make sure you see the topics we've covered. Uh, most of the stuff is going to be written in the, in the uh, other other set. Uh, please also remember there was the, the green sheet, and on the back of the green sheet, <laughs> is some uh, sort of summary alcohol oxidation. Does all that look right? What we, what we covered? Okay. And then down below is the alkene oxidation. Again, one of the big, big things of organic too is keeping your material organized. If you don't work at organizing it and getting the sort of organizing your mind of what we covered, okay. I, th I think a third to half of the difficulty. I don't like to call it difficulty. It's more of it's not, it's not done. You got to organize what we're doing, um, and that will really help you categorize things in your your mind, get things straight, and don't mix things up. <coughs> All this is organization. But you have to do that work. I supply you with some organization and outlines here. Um, okay, alkene oxidation. Now, in organic one, we cover lots of alkene reactions. Uh, for you guys that had me, uh, I don't do the oxidations. I think we do enough in organic one with alkenes. I think it's better to cover them here when we're doing oxidation of alcohols because we'll use similar reagents. And actually, you'll also get like aldehydes and ketones, very similar to how alcohol oxidation gives out as a ketone. So I just like, I just think it fits in better here. Some of you that may not have had any organic one may have already covered some alkene oxidation, like ozonolysis. Okay. Um, do you remember organic one I gave you a puzzle about alkene reactions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You remember there was three answers that I had to give you? It was these reactions. We'll look back at that. All right. Well, that's the summary. Let's don't waste time. Uh, you can look back at that any time. Let's get to it. Uh, one. We're going to see that we can oxidize an alkene to a cis vicinal diol. Okay. Now, when you see cis vicinal diol, do you just read that and just never <coughs> think about those terms again? No, right there is tons of information. 
Okay, is the product going to be cis or trans? Cis. 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 Is, is the, it's going to be a diol. What is a diol? Well, it's two OHs. Are they going to be one, two, one, three? Are they going to be adjacent to each other or what? One, two. What does visceral mean? Visceral means adjacent to each other. They're in the same vicinity. What if the two OHs are on the same carbon? Geminal. Geminal. They'd be twins. Okay. A slang term for uh, uh, a diol is a glycol. And you may have heard of ethylene glycol, which you put in your radiator. That's just a diol of ethylene, which is a slang name for ethene. Alkene. Okay. How do you make uh, cis visceral diols from alkenes? Well, you can use KMNO4. All right? Take an alkene, KMNO4. Typically, well, this is very important mild and cold, mild conditions. Later on, we'll see what happens if you do harsh conditions, heating. Also, typically, do this under basic conditions. These oxidants are more active under acidic conditions. They'll give up that oxygen more readily under acidic conditions. Does that sound reasonable? Oxygen being given up, it needs an acid to make... How do you make oxygen better leaving group? Yeah. Okay, so it's very similar. These oxygens will be... will take a height. The manganese will be reduced. That's, that's easier with an acid. We're going to keep this basic and cold. It's going to be a very milder reaction. What does this give? Well, there you go. What is that? It's cis, it's 1, 2, and it's a diol. Now, you may get an antimere if applicable, but of course, this compound here is not chiral. Right? Because there's plenty of symmetry. And so, diols are very important. Um, you may see them in biochemistry, but they're very important in just synthesis. Uh, one thing is, now we have two OHs and we can do chemistry with them and we can continue on. Okay, what's the mechanism for this? Well, it's very concerted. Uh, first thing is, what's the structure of KMNO4? You should know this from Jim Kim. Uh, manganese is manganese 7. Draw a structure like this. And then the K would sit here. Uh, the first step is a sort of a cycle addition, sort of reminiscent to Dills Alder. We're back to pi bond. Pi bonds are electron, electron bridge. They will attack something. Okay. Um, Dills Alder is what? Four plus two? Yeah. This is actually what? That's two. What is this? One. Two plus three. Okay. Basically, it's a cycle addition. You got all these p orbitals; they line up, and you get the arrangement of the bonding. Um, if you look at this arrow movement here, what does that give? This is bonding to oxygen. All right, so we got that. These electrons moving on to manganese. So, what's on this manganese that I'm not showing right here? Yes, yeah, a long pair. These electrons are coming up here and bonding here where that left. And so we have the oxygen binding to the carbon. That's a cycloaddition reaction. It's concerted. Uh, we say it's stereospecific. Um, that is now here, this is planar. Now we have tetrahedral. Um, this has got to be cis at this point. Alkene has a, has a face. It's planar. And so there's the planar alkene. The manganese can be attacked from either the front or the back. If the manganese approaches from the front, <coughs> all right, uh, the alkene attacks the oxygen, electrons, then the oxygen is going to end up sort of binding over here. Guess what? Both bonds are to the front. How is he going to end up binding to the back if everything's happening on this side? It can't. So that's why you end up with uh, both on the same side. Now I could have drawn these both dashed. But it is a sin addition.
Now at this point, we can call this a manganate ester. Okay. Uh, it's not stable. It will break down with presence of water and basically we will cleave here and these will become OHs. And we're not going to do mechanism. Okay? This part you need to understand. We're not going to do mechanism. This is lost as MnO2. That is a byproduct. Uh, we start with manganese 7. What's the oxidation of the manganese here? Four, right? So the manganese has been reduced. Something's been oxidized. What's been oxidized? We'll see the alkene. How can we judge that? How many bonds to a more electronegative atom does this carbon have? None. How many does it have now? One. It's been oxidized. That carbon's also been oxidized. In general, we say the alkene's been oxidized. Uh, again, we're not doing mechanism for that uh, hydrolysis. <coughs> okay. You've got to keep it mild and cold. We'll, uh, if not, something else will happen here, and we'll see that later on. <coughs> So, what's the product? Again, I said this before, probably will say it again. Lots of reactions. It's a little bit of memorization, but you also got to know your mechanistic knowledge. Okay? And so, just looking right here, you got to say, okay, what does KMNO4 do to an alkene? Oxygen. Oxygen. Okay, that you mechanistically, ultimately, what type of product is for? More information. There you go. That's more information for your note card. Okay. So you got to have that's that's a little bit of memorization. But then you also need your mechanistic knowledge of how this happens to help you predict things like stereochemistry or maybe to show the mechanism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so here we go. You look at this. Hey, this uh, cold, mild conditions. What is this going to be? Cis diol. So the product's going to be. Uh, we've got a methyl here. If I draw that bolded, and how about this one? Plus an antimer. Because this is chiral. And of course, the antimer would look like what? Methyl would be dashed, and the two OHs would be bolded, right? So there you go. Uh, question, how would you prepare, up there we prepared the cis dial, how would you make the trans dial? Heat. Do I? Heat. I didn't hear you. Heat. Heat. No, heat does, uh, trans dial would come from, this what do you want to react this with to give that water the epoxides don't react with just pure water water and what water and acid okay water and acid so h3o plus or what what else could you Kingsley? h I can't hear you guys. Too many Bon Jovi concerts. H2SO4. Well, that's what this is, right? I mean, that's aqueous acid. There's a million different aqueous acids that this, this means. What else could we use? We could also use hydroxide and water. Right? If you're doing here, what's the first step? Protonate. Protonate and then neutral water adds, opens that up. Here, what's the first step? Well, there's no proton. The first step is these electrons attack here. Kick that off, what does that give? This is going to be backside, right? That just opens up. That becomes this. 
And where can this get a proton? From water. Okay, when it gets a proton, there you go. So trans diols can come from your epoxide chemistry. And actually, I think we did one example of that when we were doing epoxide. I may not have stressed the fact that it was a trans diol. But now we can see that. So we know ways to make trans diols and cis diols. Of course, how do you make the epoxide? The alkene. So ultimately, alkene uh, can be starting material for diols, either directly or make the epoxide and then do diol. Okay, another way to do this, K-4 with the diol tends to be, uh, the yields aren't great. Because K-4 tends to do something else also. And even under mild conditions, it's prone to doing that other thing. Um, you can get a better yield of the, of the cis diol using osmium tetroxide, OSO4. Now with MnO4, that's going to be a minus. But with osmium, it's neutral. Because osmium is supposed to have one extra electron. But manganese is not. Um, a Lewis structure very similar for osmium tetroxide. Y'all did Lewis structures of these things in Jinkum? Mm -hmm. Y'all covered like came in a four and stuff in Jinkum? Osmium? No. Oxide structures, chromium trioxide, that type of thing. Y'all didn't you y'all didn't see metal oxidants in Jinkum? Mm -hmm. Sure. Did. <laughs> You never drew a list structure came out for? Okay. Uh, very similar to came out of four. We've got neutral here. So concerted cycle addition. It's actually two plus three. We get this here called an osmate ester. Of course, this is going to be cis. Now the osmate ester is actually stable. They can be isolated. They don't spontaneously cleave. And we have to use a reagents to get it to cleave. We use either hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidant, or we can use sodium bisulfite, which is actually a redu reducing agent. So you actually you can do either way, and it actually works out. You just mentioned something. Um, I'm not sure that it was clear on the previous page with uh, KMNO4, that intermediate step, it, that's a spontaneous cleavage? Yeah, it, it's, okay. the, the, the manganate ester is not, can't be isolated typically, it just, it falls apart. We didn't look at the mechanism for, for the cleavage. We're also not going to look at the mechanism here, but it is a second step, okay, and with precise reagents. So, for example, you would see you got two steps. This makes the osmate ester, then this is the cleavage. Okay. Now we can also maybe call this uh, magic. Okay. Remember we had a magic step in organic one. We got the uh, hydroboration, ox uh, oxidative cleavage. Okay. Again, it's a little bit of predictive product memorization, but you got to have some mechanistic knowledge. Particularly, you also need some stereochemical knowledge of uh, when we do a cyclic, it's a little easier to do with stereochemistry. If it's not cyclic and you got rotation, you, you got to be careful about your outcome here. What does this do to an alkene? Cis diol. Yeah, it's a cis diol. By the way, osmium gives a better yield of your cis diol. Okay? That's the good part. The bad part is osmium tetroxide is much more toxic. And it's almost like you don't want to be exposed to this stuff. So here's your dilemma. You want good yield, but very toxic, 
Or do you want to just get an average modest yield and deal with a reagent that's very benign? Good yield. Okay, you have options. Osmium tetroxide, you don't want to breathe this stuff. Actually, is osmium, um, I may not have put this on here. Okay. Let's see. So here's the product. Here's your cis diol. Of course, we wouldn't call this cis because that's free rotation. What do we want to call that type of product? Well, this cis is not appropriate because I can draw this. I mean, I can draw it like that. These are the same thing, right? So is it cis or trans? That's why I don't use this terminology. What are we going to call this product? How about miso? That would be more clear. Yeah? Now, does that mean that you always get miso in this reaction? No. no this, only in this example do you get miso. That can vary. Because this is cis, it's going to get miso. Don't memorize this kid's miso, because I don't know that it always does. you got to assess this. How do we do this? A lot like I tried to recommend in Organic One. I would turn the alkene first. Did we do this in Organic One? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is the same thing. Just, just turn it. That is, instead of being on the board like this with the knuckles down, hey, can I do this? So of them down on the board like that, turn it like this, look at the methyls. Now they're work. Uh, now they're coming towards you guys. And that's kind of how it's kind of grown like that. Now, what are these reagents get due to the alkene? Cystyl. So don't they just bring in the two OHs? Now you bring them in either both of them straight up or what? Straight or straight down. But here's your product. And if you want to give that as an answer on the test, fine. I mean, whenever I ask you for answers, I don't say draw them in with the wedge down to it or the wedge to the one right. That's it. Of course, you can already see that it's miso, right? Just like we said the one up there was. Um, of course, if you drew them both down, it would look like what? Is that different than the one over there? Is this different? Is that different than this? I just told you it was miso. What does miso mean? Hey, Carl. That's the same compound over there. It's miso.
alkenes to diols. I see the diol, thus I need a alkene. something like uh, whatever, um, what do they call it? <coughs> Robitussin or something? Any that stuff. Guafenicin, okay. Uh, this, how would you make that? Uh, what if I gave you this starting material? How would you make that? By the way, this is called uh, guayacol. Oh well, for the glycol, guafenicin. That's okay. How would you make this? Yeah. I want to start with sodium hydroxide. Okay. What's next? How about a chlorine? Yes. Make the phenoxide the base, and then the base does what? I mean, then the phenoxide. That's called allyl chloride. That's very uh, potent because why is it so reactive for SN2? It's stable because of There's really no resonance here. Yes, it is primary, but that's more reactive than. Why is that more reactive? Remember the transition state? Yeah. How do you stabilize the transition state one way? Other than sterics, decreased sterics? P orbital next door? Yeah. Way to do that organic one? Yeah. It's got a P orbital next door, stabilizes the transition state. Um, why chloride? Because this is so reactive, you don't need a better leaving group than chloride. And allo chloride, you can buy a bucket of it. It's just very toxic, though. Uh, here you go. How to make this phenol? Well, maybe when we do aromatic chemistry, we could maybe make that. Maybe difficult, but you can buy a big jug of that. Let's go off anything. What's down below? That's one to work on. I think there's a couple like this in the uh, workbook. Show product in a Fisher projection. Just product in Rethro 3 of. Please do that and we'll see what type of questions there were on like Monday or, or so. So so we're bringing a lot together. Stereochemistry, good time to review the stereochemistry and the Fisher projections, etc. Okay, next reaction we're going to see is oxidative cleavage of vesyl diols. What can you do with these diols? <laughs> you can cleave them. Well, this is not an alkene reaction. So we'll get back to that. But dials can be cleaved. Treat them with uh, HIO4. What is that? It's per iodic acid. That sound right? Per iodic acid? Uh, you can cleave it. Here we go. It's a very similar structure. We've got this iodine that's in this very oxidized state. Iodine is plus seven here. Uh, we're, we're only going to do abbreviated look at the mechanism. First step is the diol reacts here with the iodine. You lose water and you get this cyclic. This looks like maybe an osmate ester or a uh, manganese ester. I don't know if it's got a name. Karate ester, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And basically, these oxygens attack the iodine and you lose water. I'm not going to show a mechanism. 
from here though, this thing will sort of collapse with this electron movement. Uh, if you start here, these electrons move down. What's being formed right here? Double bond to oxygen. By the way, I didn't say what this gives, but what we're going to do here, the two carbons that have the oxygen, we're going to cleave here, and this is going to become carbonyls. That's what we're ultimately doing. I've just turned it a little bit, but that's what happened. Cleavage and the two carbons become carbonyls. Electrons move down, so we have carbonyl. What are we doing here? These electrons move away from that carbon here. We're breaking the carbon-carbon bond. And they're moving up here to make double bond to oxygen. And these electrons are moving off. To move on the iodine as what? As a lone pair. This error movement, you should be able to understand this, gives those two plus this. Now we started with iodine plus seven. This is plus five, so the iodine has been reduced. Something's been oxidized. What's been oxidized? Each of your carbons. How many bonds to a more electronegative atom does this carbon have? One. How many does it have an ounce? <coughs> Same for the other carbon. So, just enough mechanism to give you an idea, uh, but not a complete mechanism. So let's see what we get here. Huh, what about a cyclothiol? First off, what does this do? It cleaves it, and this becomes what? So we should get this here. Now see, there is an H here, right? And when that becomes double bond, there is an H there. I just got to draw them down. That's an aldehyde. I like to draw in the H's of my aldehyde. When this becomes double bond, what have we got on the carbonyl? Nothing, and then the other part. Nothing, the other part. Nothing happens over here. Of course, we lose the stereochemistry chemistry of these carbons because they're now planar. There's your outcome. It's only one product because it's connected by that. I can hear. So there's a possible product. If we did this multi-step, link three together, when you see osmium, there's a magic step. So what does this here do? That forms this, right? And then what does the next step do? It cleaves it. By the way, you can use HiO4. Sodium peridate also works. So that's combining two steps. Make the diol and then cleave it. Ultimately, what did we do to this alkene? We cleaved it, but we got two carbonyls. Because the diol was inoxidized. This takes us to ozonolysis. Anybody not have any organic one to cover ozonolysis? Organic one? Who did not have any organic one? Did you have organic one in the fall? Uh, that was a while back in the spring. You didn't have any for did you cover ozonolysis? We didn't cover the mechanism for it at all. You didn't do mechanism for ozonolysis? Uh, we will be doing mechanism. Uh, ozonolysis is, a, is one of the top ten reactions in organic chemistry. Okay. What does it do? It does the same, essentially the same as this. It cleaves your alkene and gives you what? Two carbonyls. Two carbonyls. Okay. Please look at ozonolysis, and we'll do that on Monday. Uh, and then we'll get back to NMR on Monday. Have a good weekend. See you this afternoon.